Hey, good morning. It's your duck himself and Saturday morning at 9.02 a.m. on VOB 92.9. So I suggest by now you have your rage on. 92.9 and I'm here for one whole hour. So you're going to call in today, but I got something that happened uh, yesterday. Uh, my program was supposed to be in drug addiction. And we know the most common drug addiction is alcohol. And, hmm, that's a Caribbean thing, you know. But I'm going to postpone that because my friend Joey had a heart attack yesterday. And he didn't wake up. You know, um, hmm, uh, I should say that 92.8% of the people who... Uh, die suddenly is from a cardiovascular problem. He didn't wake up, and I'm saddened by that. He's 36. He would have been February the 6th. He would have been uh, 37. How do you explain that? Too young, gone too soon. So we are talk about heart attack today and how we in this country can combat this thing. You see, I tell you what, though, uh, I had read the statistics for you guys. I, a couple of times before, about 182 people with heart attack um, uh, in 2009 in this country, and 142 died. That's high, man, 80% plus size. Ridiculous. Why? It's something can be treated. Today we'll talk about that. How is your day going? And Mrs. P, you, you like, you, I know you're listening there, Mrs. P, you, good morning to you. And you like that little attire last night I wore, that, that the Shiki was an African prince last night on uh, <laughs> CBC, man. It was, I felt so good. You know, you put the garments on, you feel princely. <laughs> you having a good day or a bad day? A cup of coffee, a cup of green tea, good for you. Antioxidant, that's me. I am Mr. Antioxidant. Having a bad day, Daniel Poulter. And I'll be back. But this day, we'll talk about heart attack, and you can call me at 441771, uh, 441790, 441791. Um, uh, we'll be a cause, but a bad day, Daniel Poulter. And I'll uh, be right back. Daniel Poulter got some vision roots. So we here we got Rihanna, but we got some other guys out there kind of doing some stuff. Daniel Poulter, Beijing Roots, bad days. So here I am again. Uh, hope you're having a good day. Um, every day can be good. And be bad when you mix them. And as I talk about balance of forces, some things can't always happen. You know, your car break down and can't get to work, and you're very distraught. But look at it as good because. Could have been worse. Could have been you. You're in the car. I mean, actually, that you got some health issues. Your most valuable asset is health. Hmm. And I mean that. You healthy. You get in the morning. You look in the mirror. You take a deep breath in, and um, you see everything working. Everything looking good. The other things will work themselves out. Keep yourself healthy and don't concern yourself only about what you look like on the outside. Every year, go and get yourself checked out to see if inside is fine too. Your blood cholesterol and your sugar and your pressure and all those things that a doctor, your GP can check. Do it. Keep your car, which is your body, running. Keep your vessel good, it's yours. Huh? So, Joey left, and um, this heart attack issue is serious. And you, you need to know the signs and all those things. And most of the people, a lot of times when the person is having the heart attack, they sometimes they know what's happening, but it can take you where you're unconscious. Or your the perfusion or the blood to your brain is altered, so you can't think properly. So the family members need to have an active role wife husband children friend and what's going on you make the decision because you're cognitive at that point you need to know you need to do something called door to needle time how fast we can get you from your house first to the hospital and that's pre-hospital care where we use our ambulance and uh, then from the time you get to the hospital to the time the doctor can stick you because there's these things called thrombolytics. 
um, TPA and so forth they're called. Uh, used to use streptokinase, we don't use it very much anymore, but uh, metalase and TPA and all those things and autoplase, those are drugs that are used infused into your bloodstream and then it breaks up the clot and your problems not it doesn't go away completely but you uh, you, you save muscle and time is muscle the more muscle we save better the odds of you walking out of the hospital starting your life again it's the arrhythmia that kills you you the damaged muscle cause arrhythmia where your heart goes at 400, 500 beats per minute and that's not enough to perfuse your organs and you go you just need a four minutes of decreased blood flow to the brain and you find brain cell death happening that's how the whole process occurs so it's important someone having a heart attack you as a family member you have to know don't panic you have to know what to do you will need to call the ambulance because, uh, well, yeah, people are talking about the ambulance. We'll talk about the ambulance today. But, uh, oh, God, you're going to wait a, one hour to get an ambulance or um, I better put him in the car and just drive him to the ER. All of those things we can talk. You share your thoughts with me today about that. But I think that my duty, I think I want to see how much I can cut back the amount of people dying from Heart attack in this country by decreasing the door to needle time, the time the, uh, that patient presents, quickly triaged and get straight to the doctor and you save a life. Think about that little thing. I'll give you them in bits today. But we need to decrease that. You're not supposed to die. Everybody, well, some we can't save. According to the national average, one third die before they get to the hospital. But we're talking about 80% in this country. <laughs> I'm not postulating this stuff. It's our registry. We do research, we do studies, and this is what's happening. And we need to, I am gonna make sure I'm a part of getting this done. Even if it means putting a doctor in the ambulance, getting there so things can start out on the field. Think about that a little bit. And time will tell that Bob Marley, you know, I always talk about Bobby. Give us a call. Give us your thoughts, 441771, 441790441791, and call us, let us know what you think about your thoughts, and I'll be back after uh, Bob coming with Time Will Tell. Yeah, that's Bob Marley. You think you're living in heaven, but you're living in hell. Your hell only starts when the chest pain starts, and we got a few callers, and I'll take a few calls. Morning. You're in the air. Yeah, good morning, Doc. Yeah, good morning. Could you... Give a brief a brief talk on, on the lower blood lower blood pressure. Okay. As as regards um, when you, when you have a, a lack of um, a lack of water in the system, dehydration you call it. All right, right. you got okay. dehydration problem and low blood pressure. Those are the two issues, right? Right, right. That's okay, then. Thank you. Good hang I I'll address them. Um, first, the low blood pressure. It depends on what is normal for you. I, I say to people. First of all, you figure out what's normal, to know what's abnormal. If your pressure normally runs around 100 over 80, some people I know that, older and younger people, 100 over 80, 100 over 70, 100 over 60, and you're doing well, you don't have a problem with dizziness, you don't have, that's what it's been. That's normal for you, you shouldn't worry about it. The brain has a reset mechanism that would allow enough blood to go to all of your organs, your brain inclusive, um, if your pressure, is, that's normal for you. But if you're running at 100 over 60, and one day you wake up and it's doing 80 over 40, that's low for you. So it's, uh, low blood pressure always has to do what's relative to the norm. Now if I have a pressure that runs at 130 over 180, and my pressure one morning is 105 over 70, that's low. So it's the decrease from what baseline is. So some people are concerned about, they go to the doctor and doctor say, your pressure is low. No, if you're functioning properly, fine, all the years you've had low blood pressure, that's fine, good for you. It's better than the high one. Remember, high is over 140 over 90. So it only becomes pr a problem, as I reiterate, if when the pressure is low, you're having symptoms like dizziness, when you stand up, the, the, the walls are spinning around, and those type of lethargy and fatigue, then you should have uh, your doctor consulted with that. Maybe you're on 
too much of medicines um, that would cause your pressure to drop like that. Or also, if you're dehydrated, you should have, this is the second question, if you're dehydrated, it means that your blood volume has contracted. Yeah, you're not taking enough fluids. Most times, the body's in, the mechanism would be to shrink. There's something called angiotensin II, which is the most potent vasoconstrictor. Uh, the mechanism of the body would be to release more of this. So, and then aldosterone also in the whole pathway is released a lot. So, it retains salt by in, that will increase your volume of intravascular volume of fluid by pulling fluid from the tissues and also angiotensin II is going to constrict the arteries and it makes sense right and that will bring the pressure up if you find that your pressure is and your heart rate at the same time should go up if your pressure is low and your heart rate is not going up it means a mechanism has been interrupted so Dehydration, of course, can cause your pressure to drop, but the body should have mechanism to put it back in place, ah, except you're severely dehydrated. So always drink four to six glasses of water every day. That's recommended, especially as you get older, because your body does not have the same mechanism to keep the body uh, replenished with water. Uh, you lose a lot of water as you get older, so the kidney is not as strong as it used to be. So you drink the fluids, four glasses of water every day, keep yourself hydrated, and know what's normal blood pressure for you. If there's drop, uh, especially it's symptomatic drop from what normal is, that's something should be addressed. Um, and your doctor can help you with that. We have another call? Okay, drop that call. All right, so door to needle time. We're going to get, we need to, we're going to, in this country, we're going to improve our pre-hospital care where we can be able to, Try to get more ambulance in our, ambulances out there, so we can get to your, uh, uh, you know, to your home as soon as possible, and, and decrease the door to needle time when you get to the hospital. Uh, I, I am going to be active involved in that, actively involved in that because I have made a decision to go in the ambulances myself on some of these cases or send some doctors out there in the ambulance so that the, the care can start from the time you get a heart, start to have the chest pain. Let me tell you what you're looking for. You're looking for that heaviness in your chest. You feel like an impending doom. And you feel like you have to put your hand and rub your chest. And you start to sweat and uh, short of breath. And you start to feel like if you're fainting and going, that's the big one coming there. Don't wait around. And don't drive yourself to no hospital. Get somebody to take you there if the ambulance is not coming. But call the ambulance first. Because with the ambulance, we can give you aspirin, which everybody should have in your home. Have a bottle of aspirin there. And if a, you feel that your family member is having a heart attack, Give them an aspirin, except they have, if they're allergic to it. And they're allergic to aspirin. There's something called Plavix. Keep it in your home. You can get it. Go to your doctor and ask them, oh, listen, keep some of these drugs there. I'm allergic to aspirin. And put some Plavix on board. You take one of those, uh, each of those pills, and it will start to stabilize the clot that is forming. A heart attack, really, is a clot forming and a blockage around your arteries. And then what you happen, it was happens is that this muscles start to die. That's where the pain come from. And then everything is a casket out there. You got to get to the doctor very, very soon. So while you call the ambulance, you give them this aspirin or this Plavix, whichever one. I prefer the aspirin. If they're allergic, you use Plavix. And, um, and, and get, get them quickly to the hospital. Now, if a doctor's on board, he can be there with thrombolytics where we can give you this. Uh, thing on the ambulance and have you monitored at the same time and, and be able to break the clot and save muscle and save the function um, and so forth. So that's what the plan is. The door to needle time, we're going to decrease that. So reflex, call the ambulance and then give the aspirin or the plavix or the aspirin or both. It doesn't matter. You give that, it stabilizes that uh, uh, clot that is being formed right there and will save muscle. We get you to the hospital, we can uh, then do things. There's something called primary uh, angioplasty, which needs to be uh, worked on more in this country, where you come in and you're refractory, sometimes the pain don't go away, and you need to have a stent place in there right away so that you could uh, uh, go on with your life. And remember, it's just about blood flow. You want to remove the 
the, the, the clogging and you want to, and the pipe as we'd call it, clear the pipe. So it can be done. It's done in this country. We, we have, uh, compared to the Caribbean, um, superior health care. And I think that if uh, we are here about tourism and health tourism, and we want to attract people to come to our country, so we meet all of these things, and number one cause of death is cardiovascular problems. So we want to make sure that everything is in place, so when our visitors come, they know if something happened, we are able to take care of them. Uh, lots of information I got for you today, but I'm going to give you them in bits, and don't forget to call that number. Uh, we got a caller? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Sparman. Good morning. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. And yours. To you too. Thanks. Yes. Um, I noticed last night when my husband was sleeping, mm -hmm. he kept sounding as though he had stopped breathing. And then all of a sudden you hear this snorting, <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay. No. Does that have anything to do with the heart? And the second question is, if you are a person who can't take aspirin, what do you do? Okay. I, I have three, a, a third question. Right. <laughs> and, um, his hands are numb constantly. He, where his fingers and yeah. the palms of his hands are uh -huh. constantly numb, and no matter uh, what you do. Uh, let me ask you a couple questions just before you get off the air. One, mm -hmm. is, he, is he obese? He's got a weight problem? Yes. All right. One. Well, the second thing is, uh, you got diabetes? No, he is hypertensive mm. and high cholesterol. All right. I'm going to answer your question. You can hang up and answer them for you. Thanks for calling. Okay. Thank you. First of all, uh, there's something called Pickwickian syndrome, where a lot of people, if they're obese, as they lay down, they close the airway, and there's a lot of snoring going on, and the air cannot because the, the neck is flexed. They can't get an ear to the bron to the trachea and the bronchioles, and so breathing becomes a problem. Those people a lot of times have uh, they're, they're obese and they have sleep problems, sleep apnea, where you find that you with sleep apnea because of this dysfunctional, you get enough air uh, into the system and so forth. A lot of times, what happens? The breathing is paused for the obstruction. It pauses and then starts back again. There's a lot of snoring, a lot of all of those things. What you're describing there is for, with an obese individual is Pickwickian syndrome. Those patients can have heart problems because a lot of Pickwickian syndrome patients have uh, have disease of the heart because the heart and the lung are integrally related. They're like lovers. Now, secondly. Aspirin and Plavix, uh, there's something called clopidogrel, or the other name is Plavix, you would see it on television. If you're allergic to aspirin, you may be asthmatic and you have polyps uh, within your no uh, nostrils and so forth. A lot of these patients are allergic to aspirin. Clopidogrel or Plavix, one of those a day will do its almost as good as an aspirin, okay? And lastly, we reference to the numbing of the hands and so forth. You, diabetes is something you should be screened for. Make sure before he eats in the morning, take him to, the, to your GP and get a fasting blood sugar to see if uh, his sugar is high. If it's over six and is fasting, then he may be pre-diabetic or diabetic, depending on how high it is. And the doctor can treat you with a lot of the uh, uh, presentation of, of diabetes is tingling the hands and the feet and so forth. Uh, also potassium and calcium and um, magnesium would have these type of uh, symptomatologies where you have a lot of paresthesias and, and tingling. So take him to get some blood work done uh, with a check for these electrolytes and, and for sugar and they, that may point you in the right direction. I thank you for calling. And I hope I answered your questions. Do you have somebody else there or we go back? We do? Okay, no. So, uh, yes, but don't, we talk about heart attack today, guys. We want to save our nation. We want to decrease the incidence. Yes, we know we eat a lot of, um, fatty stuff and saturated fats and we know we, our diet is very much similar to the Western diet, which we are trying to, um, cut back on. And this year, 2013, I want you to save some money, stop eating a lot of those things and try to plan some more. 
go out there and plant some vegetables. We have very fertile soil. Tomatoes and those things grow very, very quickly and uh, things like cabbages and so forth. Uh, all of that, spinach, you just plant them there so you'll have your cut back on your cost in reference to buying vegetables and so forth but you increase the fiber in your diet um, if you increase the fiber in your diet what you do you decrease your cholesterol levels and also um, you decrease the incidence of heart problem it's all about diet and modification of lifestyle but when the event would have happened I'll tell you when I come back about some of the things you can do because sometimes you can yes take the patient to the hospital but what about if you wake up and they're just unconscious what do you do it's time to panic but a few things you can do cold play in my place and i'll be right back yeah in my place cold play i was lost now i'm found no? music as the food, I I can't imagine a world without music and doctors. The doctors here himself to deliver to you living every day, every Saturday from nine to nine thirty. But today we got nine to ten. So you guys who missed us, you got me. And uh, hey, we might go on. You never know. Wishing that we might be able to do this hour stuff to see how you do. Uh, uh, you have me. I want you to call me and let's talk about heart attack. And we talk about arrhythmia. If you, if somebody is, uh, I mean, door to needle time also. Uh, if somebody's got a chest discomfort, don't forget there are people who, uh, uh, well, you know, would present in a typical fashion the diabetics. They may not have the chest pain, but they may have real shortness of breath and they can't breathe. They feel like if they're suffocating. Because the nerves are damaged, might have a big heart attack occurring there. You want to call the ambulance. And as I said before, this year, my resolution for this year is to decrease the heart attack incidence and also to decrease the amount of mortality or death occurring as a result of a heart attack by being there. I'm going to get, make sure to get some ambulance and doctors on board so we can save this nation and, um, you know, move towards a healthier, healthier lifestyle. we got to call her, don't we? Good morning. In the air, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Yes, Yes, hey, ma'am. How can I be of service today? Um, I'm calling because my dad has actually suffered from a head stroke. And my mom... She was diabetic and expensive. I am also diabetic and expensive, but I would like to know in the light of all of this has a yet hereditary problem. What do I do? And basically, I am on medication, but sometimes medication don't work really work. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the medication would be very, you would use it, the pressure would be down today, then the sugar would be up tomorrow. The sugar mm -hmm. would be down today, pressure would be up to more it could be a one up one down, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's not being stable. Yeah. Sometimes at night get get to work properly. And if you do get up for half sleep like a three hours, you've gone off no sleep and it's very difficult. I just would like to know basically what to do at time in my late forties and fifty and going down the line, you know, everybody suffering from heart attack and yeah. so from the life. Well, I use no much meat, I'm a vegetarian, mm -hmm. and I keep away from lots of fats and do my exercise and everything like that, but yet still, there's a lot of tension I would like to get clarified on the subject. Oh, no, I agree with you, and thank you for calling. Uh, that, that, you see, um, I'm, and I'm concerned about the high cholesterol also, because most time they're like the trios, you know, the diabetes and the high blood pressure and the high cholesterol, they seem to hang out together. And um, the, 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 the high cholesterol, you want to put a plaques there, the uh, low-density lipoprotein on the arteries to start the whole process. And then the diabetes in itself does not help because it causes some dysfunction of the endothelial cells, the cells around the inside of the arteries, which <laughs> exactly is a nidus for the plaque formation, and high blood pressure does the same thing. So those three together, that's why people who've got those three, and they seem to have a high incidence of heart attacks. So you, your, your duty is to make sure you see a endocrinologist, uh, a guy who deals with diabetes. There are a couple of them well on the island that you could find out in the, in the phone book. And help to have your diabetes control. You may need a mixture of things like tablets and insulin, 
or insulin alone or a mixture of insulin, long acting, short acting, there's always a way to treat that diabetes. But I tell you, it's one of our serious, serious non-communicable uh, diseases that we have here in this country. And, um, and, and, and the, the, it's very rampant and has to do a lot with abdominal fat. Um, you put on a lot of weight and uh, diabetes seems to be right around the corner. So um, risk factors, those three that you have there, I would say that you need to have the endocrinologists involved and to give you medicines to keep because if you control the sugar and the pressure and the cholesterol and so forth, uh, you uh, would have a decreased likelihood of heart disease. You're in the age where you soon will be uh, menopausal or premenopausal, so uh, which of course is between 50 to uh, plus or minus four years, um, except if you had a hysterectomy. So uh, yes, you would need to really screen and say, I understand your concern. Uh, I would work vigorously on that, your priority. But your diet, don't forget the modification of diet. Right now, you should not be put in sugar in any meal, any type of uh, tea and so forth. No, even the, 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 they have all of these substitutes. Stay away from that. Get yourself accustomed to drinking your tea or your whatever you drink, uh, whether it's coffee or tea. Um, make sure you have no sugar in there and skim milk or soy. Use those type of low saturated fat stuff. And then uh, eat a lot of vegetables. I know they said Dr. Sparman or they said a doctor, whoever the doctor is or the primary doctor, they would say, listen, uh, we wanna, you want us to eat like a rabbit? It's not about that. It's about living. Everybody wants to live. You do not realize how cherishable life is until you at the almost at the end. Then people will do anything they want to get some life, even a year more. You go to a guy who's dying, and what does he say? Give me a month. He'll, he'll settle for a month, a peaceful month. Don't wait for those uh, endpoints and crossroads. Right now, you have an active duty. Do a lot of exercises. The American Heart Association recommend 20 minutes of brisk walking uh, three times a week. You can do a little bit more than that. But my point is, is that find an exercise that you like. You like the bikes? Do the bike. You like running? Run, ride, swim, jump, skip. But find something that you like where you can increase your heart rate. That's what the point is. If you find something you enjoy, then you know what happens? You, your chance of jumping off the bandwagon decreases considerably. Me? I go to the gym and I do six things for the past 25 years. Just six simple exercises I do. And I come out, you know what? I keep doing that because I enjoy it. I see guys going there and doing all kind of lifting weights heavy and doing... I don't know. If you like that, fine. But you find something you like and you'll stay on. So exercise, modification of your lifestyle. Stay close to the plant. And when I use that phrase, stay close to the plant, I'm saying, when you're eating something, ask yourself, am I eating plant product? Is there fiber in here? Is there nutrients here? Or the foods you eat, is this nutritious or is it all a bunch of calories? Those are the questions you want to do. You see the ground provision? Fiber in there and a lot of minerals and vitamins. So everything you put in, think that way. Is this thing doing good for my body or is it just a bolus of sugar I'm putting in here? That's things like candies and the cakes and the ice cream. I'm not saying you can't have it every now and then because I do. But you have to modify yourself once a month. Give yourself a treat. Fine, you'll find that you'll stay close and close to normal and balanced eating patterns. So those are my answers for you. And don't forget the risk factors. The more risk factors you have, the higher the likelihood of the event happening. Uh, age, if you're older than 45 for a male or older than 55 for a female, that's a risk factor. If your family, you've got a family who died suddenly or somebody's got uh, heart problems, had a stent placed in them or they had bypass surgery, they had a heart attack, uh, it's a close family, brother, sisters, uh, uncle, aunt, uh, grand grandparents and so forth, then you're at risk. That's not a risk factor right there. Obesity, you have increased abdominal fat. It has to do mostly with your waistline. Um, you have high risk. Uh, smoking, uh, yes, that's another risk factor. How about high cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension? How 
How about sedentary lifestyle? All of those things are risk factors. The more you have is the higher the proportion uh, you'll have, or it's directly proportional to the incidence of heart attack. So work on your risk factors, guys. And But we're talking about when, you, when an event occurs, what do you do? Somebody's laying on the ground and they're out. You know most probably they're having an arrhythmia. And all you need a split second as soon as the blood uh, flow decreases to the brain because if the heart is beating at 500 beats per minute, uh, yeah, you can't, uh, you can't that's, not, that's not sustainable with life. So you, the precordial thump, as I said before, that's what you can try. Give them a nice uh, nice strike in the chest, the middle of the chest. What will happen a lot of times, you stop the arrhythmia and you give us time to get there uh, with the ambulance, okay? And pick that patient up and save a life. Listen, the life is valued more than any money and anything else. You need to get that loved father or brother or sister or friend to the hospital and give them 30 for the more years to live. Those are my issues. Um, I will come back, as a matter of fact, and talk to you a little later. Yeah, let me take a call. You're in the air. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. How can I be of service? Um, if probably the only difference between like what we call in barbers ear or gas, then can I have to talk first and first? Mm -hmm. The next one is can it be like if we can cough and dry cough in the building night like, for like uncontrollably dry cough? Uh, is that present itself as a heart attack too? Can that be a heart attack coming mm -hmm. on? Mm -hmm. And next one is, if you ever have a murmur, is that easy to get a heart attack then or not? Okay, thank you for calling. First question. Yeah, you know, sometimes the cough depends if you're in a medicine, in some type of medical, uh, some people are taking blood pressure medicines and a very, uh, very, uh, high likely culprit is ACE inhibitors like Ramipril and, um, Altaze and, and Zestril and things like that and, um, Captopril. Those are all ACE inhibitors and they're one of the most serious and most common side effects. Dry cough. But if you're not in those type of things, sometimes what can happen in a cough, a cough has to do with something with the lungs, something's irritating the ciliary bodies or the cilia within the bronchia and the alveoli and so forth, or stimulating the trachea or the bronchioles, you know. Um, and you get a cough reflex because you want to get the stuff out, whatever it is. A lot of times uh, people may have fluid in the lung and they have a cough, uh, apart from being short of breath. So those are some, some of the things you have to know what's going on, what your risk factors are, and so forth. But a lot of times the cough comes from using some type of drug. Uh, I said a typical presentation, everybody does not have um, heaviness in the chest and the, and the shortness of breath and the palpitations. It can just be that, it can be a cough. But you have to know if you have more risk factors, you should have your doctor check your medicines and have that evaluated by your doctor. Um, uh, in reference to the reflux problem, yes, uh, a lot of people, they got air in the stomach and, and, and the older way we used to do it as doctors we used to blame everything and, and reflux but the best thing to do is to make sure it's not your heart first then blame it on reflux because reflux does not kill anybody sometimes constant chronic long-standing reflux will cause some uh, changing of your cells uh, we call it Barrett's esophagus where uh, the cell can be precancerous and so cancerous and so forth but that's a long-term thing um, but one uh, that <laughs> still that there's therapy for that type of stuff but my point is is that if you having a um, type of heartburn feeling like it's something burning in the center of your chest associated with, reflu with gas and, and reflux disease no, you need to check first of all, check out it's not, make sure it's not the serious thing which is the heart attack and then go on to the other things um, thank you for calling good morning, you're on the air Hi, good morning, Dr. Sparman good morning, yes, how can all I right. help you? happy new year thanks, same to you is it alright to take Plavix and Coreg at the same time? Oh yes, um, Plavix in itself is a blood thinner. It's, it, it works in the platelets, uh, working the receptors in the platelets because a blood clot, especially, well, mostly the clot that occurs in the artery. We're not talking a lot about a clot that occurs in the veins. Um, it's a red clot. And the white clot is the one that occurs in the arteries. It has to do with platelets. And what happened with the blood clot, the platelets aggregate or, or come together and clog up and then the clot forms on top of the platelets. Plavex, what it does, it stops the aggregation 
um, of the platelet so that you don't have this clot formation. And aspirin does the same thing. They work on different sites on the platelets, which are small little uh, bodies within the body that starts the clotting in the arteries and so forth. Uh, so aspirin and plavix, they're good. But if you're taking a Coreg or any of those, those drugs, they're not, um, they don't work against each other. Most people are on aspirin or on some form of uh, a beta blocker. So aspirin with beta blockers or aspirin with Vastoril or aspirin with all of these um, uh, other cardiac Tenormin, all these other cardiac pills, as well as Nervas and, and so forth, they're not, they work together. Most people are in all them because when you have a heart problem, a lot of times you put you in stuff because you got a pressure problem too. So yes, you can take Plavix uh, with, with all of those other cardiac drugs, including beta blockers, Coreg, and so forth. Thank you. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Yes, please, you're in the air. Good morning. Hey. Happy New Year to you. Happy, same to you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm having a problem with my hands and my feet. I find that I, I'm getting these spasms, right? Mm -hmm. um, like a crippling type of action. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what could cause that. And with my feet, they're, they're causing me the same thing, but not as regular as I'm getting it in my hands. So I want to know what could be causing that. You're not diabetic, are you? Not, not as far as I know. Okay, good. So, we, uh, thank you for calling, ma'am. We have a previous similar caller earlier, uh, reference to this numbness and the tingling of the hands and the feet. And I mentioned electrolytes. Get some electrolyte, electrolytes done with your doctor. Get the blood work uh, for sugar. Check in to make sure you're not diabetic, which is number one on my differential. And then you have, you think about um, uh, potassium, and you think about uh, magnesium and calcium and so forth and sodium. All all of those electrolytes that are present in your blood, uh, from simple blood tests, we can tell that they're high or low. They can cause these tingling problems. Um, so have that blood test done, and let's see what's going on with you to make sure that you're not in. And then also there's something called decreased blood flow. If you have peripheral uh, vascular disease where you have clogged arteries in your legs, um, you can have numbing and tingling of your feet because decreased blood flow means that you're not getting enough blood to the nerves, and the nerves start to react in that when you feel bored morning and tingling sensation and so forth. I want to uh, give you statistics right now. 55.3% of the people who've got blockages in the, uh, in the, in the limbs, the legs, uh, you got poor circulation, blood is not getting down there, would have, or even a carotid going to your brain. They have 55.3% that would have a heart, uh, would have heart disease or heart blockage also. And if you got a heart problem, 33.3% uh, of the, those people would have blockage in the legs and also in the carotids going up to the brain and so forth. So the whole vascular network are interconnected. Um, so be careful. If you're at risk, please check your heart out because, yes, you can lose a limb and so forth. Um, and those we want to save too. Um, that's another story. Uh, we being the high, um, highest uh, per capita uh, amputation rate in the world. That's not, that's, that's, that's not, we gotta work on that. It's the same way as uh, we can go in there and put stents in, open up your arteries and save your heart. We can put stents down there in your leg also and um, decrease the blood flow to your lower extremities so that you can uh, get blood flow on your, everybody have an ulcer and so forth. More cells go down there, you have healing and so forth. And, uh, and, and instead of having amputation, we can save the leg. So all of these things are important. And I don't see many people with amputations in this country living very long. They get depressed, they stay at home, they don't want to come out because the system is not set up uh, like the best, the, the more developed countries where you have the bus <laughs> and you have the, all these nice different um, uh, prosthesis you can use and the pavement, everything designed for people who are handicapped. So, <laughs> check your doctor early. There's all this whole, they're all interconnected. And I'm going to come back. I have uh, the uh, right here where you belong um, by Mr. Wash, Jerry Washington. And I'll play this and I'll come back. And we wrap things up. I'm happy that you're listening today, but heart attack, we want to prevent that stuff. We're going to be, we want to, this year, I am going to be integrally involved in getting the ambulance to you earlier. Uh, whatever ambulance, I'll get some doctor. We want to try to get some doctors on those ambulances to get you to save some lives right here where you belong with Jerry Washington. 
How long was that song? That song came out a long time. It still got a bite, man. Who was Kim? Must be somebody. You better love it. Most guys write long songs there. It's an experience. I wrote songs too when I was on the stage, man. I, and you think it was your experience incorporated there. So Kim, uh, yeah, there was a Kim somewhere. <laughs> or somebody. He called Kim. That was somebody. And all those things. Hey, now to wrap this whole program up. Somebody's got chest pain and they're getting a heart attack. As I said, the the the, the counter statistics, uh, our our rate for death from heart attack is high. So we've got to bring that down, and we can only do that by pre-hospital care. We're going to try to see if we can. Um, my move for this year is try to see if we can get some doctors on the ambulance. So when the ambulance comes to you, they can start with the aspirin, the plavix, and the heparin, clexane, and so forth. Give the fluids, bring the pressure up, give you medicine, keep your heart rate up, and so forth. So when you get to the hospital, your door to needle time decreases 60 minutes at least before you can get 30 to 60 minutes before you can get some thrombolytics, or at least before 90 minutes before you can get to the cat lab or the operating room where we can go in there and put some stents and open up those arteries and save your life. That's the plan for this year. Decrease the incidence and hopefully that when we get the statistics down the road again, we'll improve our numbers. Our country, everybody wants to come here and really be a part of the Mecca of the Caribbean. And yes, it's beautiful. Sun shines every day and rain and the sun. And we don't have to deal with the snow and stuff. So you walk all day, you get up, you put your head on or you... Don't put your hat on, you go out. Um, we love you, you tourists. You came here and you enjoyed your, uh, uh, your... Please take back some of our music and some of our culture back with you to England and to the States and to the Canada and Germany and all those places. Take it with you and when you talk about us, how wonderful a people we are. We love you. We care for you. And we, uh, this is the doc himself. He's here with you every Saturday morning from 9 to 9.30. Go on your net and listen to me from wherever you are because this is the, with all the technology right now, it's not about here only. Uh, you can be, the voice can be heard anywhere. VOB 92.9 back next week. God bless you.